is how many of you guys were at my pre presentation, I guess last year, um, when we did it, just a couple of you guys? All right, so it, hopefully it will be new to some of, to some of you. Um, but um, Claire and I have been working on developing a, a new research um, area um, that, as Claire mentioned, focuses on um, kids that are having serious behavior problems in the schools. Um, and sort of the intellectual scope that we're trying to do. And what I'm going to do in this presentation today is do a brief overview of, you know, why we've chosen this scope. And um, I've definitely, I've tried to keep this very short because I would like a lot of discussion um, with this. But what we've chosen as, as the scope is to conduct research on the various causes that can make a student show serious conduct problems in the school setting. And identify the various risk factors in the child, his family, and his school context that could modify this risk. So basically trying to understand what would make a student um, act in these ways, and then use this research to test innovative methods for identifying children with serious behavior problems, so that, and to identify their specific needs so that they can be targeted in interventions. And then sort of the pinnacle is all of that should lead to developing and testing innovative interventions to prevent and treat serious behavior problems with three key you know, the ways that our interventions um, are tailored to be early in development. So to try and capture these students as early as possible, um, to do these interventions implemented in the school setting. Um, it's, it's really interesting. Um, a lot of times these kids with behavior problems um, you know, are looked at as sort of under the purview of the mental health setting in young kids or the juvenile justice setting in older kids. Um, but we're going to make the case uh, that the most effective interventions are implemented in the school setting and very key um, interventions that engage the child's parent in the treatment and establish collaborations between families and schools. So what is all this, this based on? Um, if you look at research on what can make a student act um, out in the school setting, we've been very good at documenting really hundreds of risk factors. Um, you know, I've limited to these on these slides for the very scientific reason that that's all I could fit and you could still read it, because they're literally hundreds. And they range from various dispositional factors like neurochemical abnormalities, birth complications, personality, factors, um, low verbal intelligence, poor academic achievement have all been linked to behavior problems. And you can have just as many contextual factors that have been linked. Uh, again, ranging from very early prenatal exposure to toxins, poor quality child care, high crime neighborhoods, problems within the peer, problems within the family environment. And so in terms of research on the causes, we've been very good at identifying sort of various factors. And you're probably sitting there, I bet you can think of things that I've missed um, on this list, either within the child or within um, his or her context. But here's um, what, what's um, important for us, is just identifying these things can have important implications in the sense that if you know a child's been prenatally exposed to toxins, so let's say a child has been exposed to alcohol during pregnancy, um, that can put a child at risk for later behavior problems. And there have been some incredibly effective high-risk nursing programs that have gone in and worked with mothers who are in high-risk pregnancies, improved their health, and that has led to reductions in child behavior problems really over the next 19 to 20 years of development. But if you're a teacher in a school, knowing that that has happened doesn't give you a lot to work with in terms of, well, how will I help a child? Um, now, what we try to do is to say, what can these things do to the developing child? How can some of these dispositional or contextual risk factors, what might they do to the developing child that affects his development, that will make him more likely to act up in the school environment and affect both his social and academic outcomes? These are what we call developmental mechanisms. So our research has tried to focus on what are the developmental mechanisms that, can, that these risk factors can lead to in the child. Those are things that teachers can then target in interventions. Those are things that we can actually modify. 
Maybe we can't go back and change the child's exposure to toxins, but if we know what that might have done to the child, we can then go in and try and help the child. Now, most of this work has focused on a, a, a pathway um, that people often call more emotionally dysregulated. Um, these are things where a child gets angry um, a lot or have trouble regulating their emotions, where they, they shoot off. And there's been a number of anger coping programs that have been done and implemented in schools. Or there have been um, programs that have focused on the child's impulsivity. They act without thinking. Um, they um, do things where they feel bad afterwards, but they just act. It, it's sort of there's no regulation in terms of, of their behavior. What we've been interested in, and this has recently come to the forefront in mental health, in the most recent um, version of the DSM, the DSM-5 that came out in 2013, they recognized a group of kids with conduct disorder, so the mental health version of children with serious behavior problems, um, a group that has not responded as well to these interventions as the emotionally and behaviorally dysregulated. They're called with limited pro-social emotions. How many of you guys have heard that term before? Really? Because you sat in on the last one, Evan. <laughs> uh, um, it, it, it came out in 2013 in the DSM, and it's being considered for inclusion in the ICD. Um, in the ICD-11, it's actually being proposed. That it's not out yet, so we don't know what the final outcome will be, but it's actually being proposed there and I know that's what mental health people use and is not as, as much used in the school setting. But I think it's very relevant because if you look at it, it's defined by people who show two of the following characteristics. And it's characteristics that the child shows in multiple relationships and settings over time. So not just with one or two individual people, but they show this in most relationships and settings. So they'll show it at school, but they'll also show it at home in other settings. And the characteristics are things like lack of remorse or guilt, not feeling bad if he or she does something wrong. Um, they show a lack of concern about the negative consequences. For example, is not remorseful after hurting someone or does not care about breaking rules. They have a callous lack of empathy. They just are unconcerned about the feelings or other, others. They're often described as being cold and uncaring. They seem to be more concerned about the effects of their actions on themselves rather than on others. They just don't care about their poor performance at school, work, or other activities. They don't put forth the effort necessary to perform well and often blames others for their poor performance. And they're often described as just not showing feelings in the same way as others. They seem insincere and superficial. And most times they act very cold and emotionless. They may act quickly, uh, but it's usually for gain if they want to intimidate somebody. Um, you know, Claire can probably tell you if a, a person comes to her office wanting more um, office space, you know, if she yells and screams at them and looks very angry, they're less likely to come back. A very functional thing for a director to, to have uh, there. So was she really angry? Uh, we won't know. Uh, but they use it in a way that's effective. Now here's what's important. Um, the reason this is starting to be recognized in mental health settings is because these kids show some of the most severe behavior problems um, compared to other kids with behavior problems. And let me just show you a couple studies that, that we did. This is one that we did in a school. And you can see this, the average age here was about age 12. So, um, you know, this is called middle school in the United States. And we did this in two school systems. We screened um, everybody in four grades um, um, in two school systems. And we followed kids who had severe behavior problems alone and those that had severe behavior problems with those callous and emotional traits that make up the um, um, limited prosocial emotions. And what I want to show you here is this is at our first one-year follow-up just looking at their level of aggression in the classroom. And all I want to point out here is these are the kids without behavior problems, these are the kids that had behavior problems without those callous traits, and these are the kids that had behavior problems and callous traits. You can see in terms of their level of aggression, and these, these aggression, 
the, the scale we use breaks it down into reactive aggression, in which they seem to be responding to perceived provocation from other kids. I mean, you know how that happens in the classroom setting. These kids will just, whether it's true or not, they perceive that somebody else provoked them into acting out and being aggressive, or proactive where they acted aggressively to gain something. These kids are showing the highest rate. That's the sample mean there of both types of aggression. The kids with conduct problems, rated by their parents and teachers, without callous traits, they did not even differ from the control group on the proactive aggression. They were slightly more reactively aggressive. So what it's showing here is that within a school sample, they're accounting for most of the aggression. And even outside of school, if you look at over five years, this is their trajectory of violent delinquency. Um, this is the callous and emotional kids with conduct problems compared to this blue line, the kids with conduct problems without callous traits. They did not differ. This trajectory did not differ from the control group. So it's really showing that within kids with conduct problems, it was the kids with callous traits that were more aggressive both in and out of school and parent-rated police contacts. They were accounting for most of the police contacts in our school-based sample. Remember, it's a fairly young school-based sample. Uh, starting at age 15. And just to show you one other school-based sample, a um, colleague of mine, Bob McMahon, uh, did a study following kids from grade 7 into adulthood. And all I want to show you here is besides being more aggressive, these kids are more likely to show a more stable pattern of behavior. So if you looked at callous traits in grade 7 predicting arrests two years post high school, callous traits predict arrests and this is antisocial personality symptoms, basically antisocial behavior as an adult. And this is after controlling for sort of their level of behavior problems, whether they had ADHD, attention deficit disorder as well, and how early their behavior problems started. So other indicators that we often use to say, how severe is this kid? These callous traits predicted a more severe outcome. And one last part they have proven to be quite the treatment challenge to what we've tried with other kids with behavior problems. We did a review that we published in Psychological Bulletin in 2014, and we found of the 21 studies of treatment response, kids with callous and emotional traits, either alone or with other what's called psychopathic traits, in 85% of those studies, the callous traits predicted poor response to treatment. And these are treatments done in the juvenile justice system, like they were less likely to participate in treatment, they just um, lower quality of participation, they just um, did not do homework assignments or speak up or follow the rules. In inpatient psychiatric hospitals, they have longer lengths of stay and have more physically restrictive interventions. And in an outpatient summer treatment program, there's, the reason I include this is this is sort of an intensive summer school uh, for these kids. The callous traits were uh, negatively associated with nine of the 14 outcome measures. So here's why we want to do this, uh, this research line, is we have a group of kids who, s who show behavior problems and who seem to be more severe, particularly when we're talking about aggression and violence. So kids who we really want to do something better and more intensively with, that have not responded to what we've been trying. And so we've been embarking on this in three ways. The first thing is, can we learn a little bit more about what's going on with these kids and how that's different from other kids? And so this is why one of the goals is to study the different causal pathways. And this is something that I've been doing a lot over the last, I guess, 25 years. I'm just going to give you a couple examples just to illustrate how different the causal processes are for these kids. One of the things we do um, is we study these kids' emotional reactivity. And I'm just going to give you one example. We do this task where we show kids emo emotional pictures flash. They have threatening pictures. We have <laughs> pictures of distress. The reason we do this is we've studied how these kids process emotion in a lot of ways. And it doesn't seem like they're missing, misunderstanding emotions. That is, if you ask them to rate these pictures, they'll rate them like other kids. They'll rate that as threatening, as a negative emotion, as positive, as neutral. They understand emotions. They just don't 
experience and react to it. And so we have to measure the reactivity. And I'll give you an example. We do this task, it's called dot probe. You have an X, pictures flash for 250 milliseconds, and a dot follows either the top or bottom picture. Very simple task, doesn't require a lot of higher order thinking, so we can do it for kids very young, kids with very significant verbal impairments, um, because it doesn't require a lot of intellectual ability. And you might be sitting there thinking, well, how does that measure emotional responding? Well, you can see the picture either follows an emotional picture. I don't know if you saw that when it flashed, but that's a cat who's missing an eye and is, is hurt. And then a fork, which for most people will be neutral. And what happens here is if the dot follows an emotional picture like it did there, even though you may not be able to name that that was an emotional picture, most people will orient to the emotional picture quickly and be able to respond to where the dot was more quickly when it follows an emotional picture. It's called an emotional facilitation, intentional orienting response. This is all to say, we did this in a number of samples. I'm going to show you one from a, a group of kid, um, um, children of, our, um, of college students at the University of New Orleans where I was up until a few years ago, mean age of nine. And what I want to show you here is there was no difference in how they responded to positive emotional. So the whole idea that callous and emotional maybe is not the right word because it's not that they're completely unemotional. What it was specific for are those pictures of people in distress and pain. And if you look at it, so here are the kids with conduct problems. If the kids had conduct problems without callous traits, they actually showed an enhanced response. They were emotionally overreactive. If the kids had behavior problems with callous traits, they were underreactive. A very a different emotional profile. And a colleague of mine did something very similar but doing brain imaging and broke it into kids with conduct problems, with behavior problems, low on callous traits and high on callous traits, and looked at their amygdala response to fearful faces versus calm faces, fearful being distressed faces. And the amygdala is the part of the brain that is supposed to respond to those emotionally provoking, empathy-inducing pictures. She found exactly the same thing. Kids with kind of problems without callous traits relative to comparisons, overreactive. Kids with kind of problems high on callous traits, underreactive. So what I'm painting for you here is very, very different emotional responses in the two groups of kids with conduct problems. I'll give you one other example. When you look at parenting and its relationship to the child's behavior problems, we'd all say that that's an important factor leading to a child's behavior problems. But if you look at parents' relationship, this is a group um, from New South Wales uh, um, at the University of New South Wales. They did an observational study in their clinic of boys age four to 12. The average age was about six. And they observed them with their mother and they showed that coercive parenting using inconsistent sort of harsh, hostile parenting was highly related to behavior problems. That's what a lot of people find. But here's the key. It was only for those low on callous traits. Look, the kids high on conduct problems with callous traits, they had high rates of conduct problems irrespective of the level of the parent's hostile and inconsistent parenting. Now, before you jump all over this and say, well, so this is something that's not affected by parenting, when they looked at parental warmth, it actually had more of an effect for the callous and emotional kids. So the issue is, it wasn't that parenting wasn't related, it was just the aspects of parenting were more important depending on whether the, the child with conduct problems had callous and emotional traits. Again, suggesting we need to do something differently. And again, I could give you, I mean, we can talk about more, you know, other differences between these kids, but what I want to highlight there is we're starting to see very different things. And so we need ways of identifying these kids and doing something different. What we've been doing up to this point is doing the same thing for all kids with behavior problems, despite the fact that they may have very different emotional and contextual underpinnings to their behavior. So one of the things we've done is we've developed a number of ways of um, identifying students. 
one of, the, one of the things that we use most in research is a rating scale that was developed for use by parents and teachers. Um, and this is called the Inventory of Callous and Emotional Traits. And what's important here is it has 21 items, so it's relatively time efficient. Um, and it's been used in over 120 published studies and has been translated into 21 languages. And it seems to be measuring something similar across languages and cultures, which was very important for us to, um, to measure. Um, and so, for example, this is an Italian school sample. This is in Germany. This is in Greek Cyprus. This is a primarily African-American low-income USA sample. This is a Dutch sample. We've done in a Spanish sample. So all sorts of um, tran um, different samples with different languages. And there seems to be a callousness dimension. I'm letting you look at the items there in terms of how this is displayed and what parents and teachers rate for us to assess these traits. Not, you know, um, the I means it's inversely coded. Um, do not let my feelings control me. And uncaring, just not caring about how well they do on things, not caring um, whether they've done something wrong, they don't feel bad or guilty. And then the unemotional part, just not expressing their feelings, not being very expressive, hiding their feelings, just not seeming to show their feelings. So one of the things we want to continue to do in this line is also continue to advance how we assess these traits. We're working on a number of more clinical interviews that can get more in-depth information um, as well, but we do have a very time efficient way that parents and teachers can rate kids along these dimensions that seems to measure this quite well across different um, cultures. Now, where are we with, with treatment? Um, if you look at treatments, um, I think the state-of-the-art treatments have done two things. Um, they have been multimodal, that is, they've targeted a number of different things. They don't go in and just do one intervention. And they've been school-based and focusing early in development. Sort of what I mentioned was a key to what we want to do in this um, research area. And there is a treatment that I think has been used in the United States. Is anybody familiar with the Fast Track program? Um, the Fast Track program started in the late, um, uh, it was developed in the early 90s, but actually started being in, used in um, the late 1990s and was used in um, four school systems um, in the United States. And it was this very large trial where schools in four cities were randomly assigned to get the intervention or not. And what they've done is they've followed these kids who got the intervention into adulthood. And it's comprehensive. I'll show you what was it based. It was based in the school. It was done early on. It started, the kids were identified with serious behavior problems in kindergarten. And the intensive intervention started in the first grade. It contains both what's called an indicated and universal component. That is, the whole school got interventions, um, as well as kids who scored above the 90th percentile in behavior problems got the indicated intervention. And it followed these kids over year, and even though the intensive intervention only lasted one school year, they could get follow-up, less intensive intervention for the next four to five years. And here are the components. There was a behavior management component. This was part of the universal component where teachers were instructed on how to do appropriate classroom management for all kids. Parent management training. The parents were brought to the school and it really focused on engaging the parent in the school, school involvement, and helping the parents learn to how to control their anger. But it wor basically worked with parents to um, help them implement good contingency management in the home and to be very involved um, in the school, um, schooling of their child. Now, you might say, how do you get parents of uh, behavior problem kids to come to school? That was one of the innovative parts of this. They did a whole bunch of different things. They worked on, they, they gave transportation vouchers. They did the parenting programs at various times during the day, some in the morning, some in the evening, some at night. They did all sorts of things to encourage in attendance um, for parents. Now, 
with all of that, 60% of parents completed 12 sessions. So you're saying that's pretty abysmal, isn't that? Not when you're dealing with this population. And they've actually shown that that's an amazing attendance rate doing all of this and it had an effect. So again, I, I, you know, what, you're, what I'm trying to paint for you here is I know how hard it is to get parents to come for this, but they were able to do it. There was a cognitive behavioral skills training where it taught kids how to interact better with peers. There was academic tutoring and there was case management where there would be somebody that would go into the home and help a parent um, in to implement these things as needed. So you're probably sitting there thinking, this is a very expensive, comprehensive intervention. And if you go to the Fast Track website, they will cost out every part of this program for you. You can Google Fast Track Program Conduct Prevention. They will give you every module and every cost prevention program. They will also show you that within, by the child reach the third grade, the reduction in number of kids who were in place in special education in the targeted schools, the schools that received the intervention, paid for the intervention. Just by the third grade. By reducing the number of kids who are in special education. They now have adult, adult outcomes through age 20. And you add to that cost effectiveness, it has reduced delinquency, arrests, and general and mental health utilization in adolescents through young adulthood. And they've shown what it did was this intervention helped the child learn emotional regulation and other behavioral regulation strategies that over the long term improved academic abilities and had long-term outcomes. Now, here's where what we want to do. One thing that this fast track program showed in its outcome is that the kids who did least well guess what some of their characteristics were. The limited pro-social emotions, the lack of guilt, the lack of empathy. You can see much of the fast track program focused on things that these other kids, the, the problem solving, the hostile attributions, the problems regulating their emotions had. It didn't focus. So what we're hoping to do in our research track is to say how can we take this state-of-the-art intervention and improve it for those kids. I want to say those kids are about 20 to 25 percent of kids with serious behavior problems. So it's the minority. But as I showed you before, they're kids who operate at a really high cost to people around them because they often are the most aggressive. They often are the ones who are most likely to have the poor outcome. So what we're trying to do is to say, can we augment particularly that parent management program? And a number of us have been um, trying to do this and test out modifications of um, that parent, that parenting intervention that was used in Fast Track. A colleague of mine in Canada is looking at how to help parents learn to coach the child in the awareness and recognition of motions. Um, colleagues at University of New South Wales have worked on having parents be more engaged and warm with the child. Um, Mark um, does a lot of these things with parents. They show that these kids, the reason they miss emotions is when a parent tells the child they love them, most of the time, the child immediately orients to the parent's face. Kids with callous and emotional traits don't. It almost a, looks aversive to them looking away. And they help teach the parents how to get their child emotionally engaged in different tasks. And what's important is they're not forgetting all those behavior management, behavior modification things that they're teaching parents. They're still doing that. They're trying to augment it, and this is where we come in, um, Eva Kimonis um, and I are working on um, developing through the, the, the research line um, a way of enhancing parental warmth. Because remember, that was what was related to the behavior problems of these kids. These kids, one thing I didn't show you is they tend to focus more on rewards than punishments. Um, the, the programs that have not worked for these kids 
it seems to be more um, related to the fact that they respond to the first part of the intervention where they talk about rewards, but they don't respond to punishments. And so they're working on how to enhance the motivation of these children through rewards. You know, you can think of a lot of positive behavior programs um, um, that focus on that as well. And then improve the child's emotional literacy. Basically at a very early age, help the child um, pay more attention and learn sort of the, and understand emotions that does not seem nat come naturally to these kids. So that's sort of where I want to stop, but hopefully I, I, I made it clear. What we're wanting to do is to say we, we have started to learn some of these developmental pathways that kids go through to develop serious conduct problems. We have some school-based programs that have shown some pretty decent success. We want to make them more successful by tailoring our interventions to the unique needs of those kids and test out some innovative approaches that can be done in the schools. So that's where I'll stop and let you guys jump in.